This week we are looking at the third and fourth of the all attributes of God. We looked at God as all present and God as all powerful. And now today we're considering God as all knowing and all wise. First, God is all knowing. It, isn't it sort of a prerequisite of God that he not be ignorant of anything or foolish to any degree, right? Certainly that is how the Bible presents God as all-knowing. Psalm 147.5 says, Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. And this is God as all-knowing stated negatively that his knowledge has no limitations upon it. And then 1 John 3.20 says, If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. And this is God, as all-knowing, stated positively, that he knows everything, he knows all things, that he has perfect knowledge. God knows all things. He knows all things past, present, and future. He knows all things that have happened, that are happening, that will happen. He knows all things that could happen but won't happen and uh, things that are possible. Just Think about the extent of God's knowledge. Just consider one human life. And all the facts of that human life is a staggering amount of knowledge to know. And then consider how many different possibilities that don't come about in that one human life. And consider that for all the human lives in all the world, throughout all the history of the world, and not just visible aspects of those lies, but the hidden aspects of life, human thoughts and motives and desires, and add in all the things about non-human life that can be known. God knows all things. The, the extent of his knowledge is amazing. He knows the vast and the big. Psalm 147.4 tells us that he determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. He knows the extent of the vast universe and everything in it. And, you know, we can only guess at the number of stars in the universe. And I looked it up uh, online and read that there are about uh, an estimated 100,000 million stars in the Milky Way galaxy alone, and there are millions upon millions of galaxies. And the article I was reading uh, goes on to say, no one would try to count stars individually, but God does. And he doesn't just count them and know how many there are, but he calls them all by name and presumably calls them all the right names at all the right times. I can't even do that with four kids, but God does it with an unfathomable number of stars. He knows the vast and the big. He knows even the tiniest details of our world and our lives, even the most seemingly insignificant of tiniest details. Matthew 10.30 reminds us that our Heavenly Father knows the number of hairs on the head of each one of His children. Have you ever tried to count hair? God knows the precise, exact number at every stage of our lives. And he knows, if he knows all those seemingly trivial things, then certainly he can be, we can be assured and comforted by the fact that he knows everything he needs to know about us in order to care for us as our perfect Heavenly Father. He knows even the tiniest details. He knows the vast and the big. He knows the seemingly random and chance events of this world. Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. The lot was basically like dice, like rolling dice. So even those things which appear to us to have no rhyme or reason or predictability, things that to us are random, even those are known to God and under his sovereign control. He knows the seemingly random and chance. He knows the most secret and hidden things. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 reminds us that God's word judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Because nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight, but everything is 
is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. He knows it all. He knows the secret thoughts and attitudes of our heart, even those things uh, that we would never utter to another person and never want someone else to know. They are not hidden one bit from God's knowledge. But it's as though they were as out there in plain sight as anything else, as our most public visible actions to him. He knows them. In Psalm 139, we considered this psalm previously to uh, see God's, uh, God is all present. But in that psalm, we also see God is all knowing. We see David in wonder at how God knows him through and through, inside and out, even the most hidden parts of him. God's knowledge is comprehensive and extensive. God's knowledge is also perfect. His knowledge of the past doesn't get fuzzy for him. He doesn't forget anything no matter how distant as is bound to happen for us. But he remembers the past as though it were right now. He doesn't learn new facts or future events as we have to. He isn't surprised by or mistaken about anything as we often are. Nothing in the future lies hidden or uncertain to him. His knowledge doesn't increase or decrease, but it's perfect. He knows all things fully and perfectly. He doesn't have to learn as if he had to improve uh, an incomplete or imperfect knowledge. If he had to learn things, how could we at any point be sure we could then trust him? Not only does he know all things, he knows all the facts, but he also knows how to evaluate all those facts. He knows perfectly the truth content of all things, what is true and false, what is right and wrong, what is good and evil. He not, knows all things and he knows what to think about all things. I don't know about you, but it seems like it's harder and harder to know what's true about anything these days. And it's not only hard to know what's true, but even when we discover the true facts about things, it's sometimes hard to know what to think about those facts, how to evaluate them. None of that is hard for God. He doesn't have to figure anything out or sort or sift through all the information or fact check his sources or consult sources at all. He simply knows. He consults his own infallible knowledge of all things. And he is never wrong, but is always right in his knowing all things and knowing what is right and good. He knows the whole story. He knows what to think about the whole story and every part of it. God's knowledge is comprehensive and extensive and perfect. Now, I'll address briefly a couple of objections. Uh, there are a couple objections that are often raised to God as all-knowing, the attribute of God's omniscience. First, some people point to scripture passages on the surface, the very thin surface, I think, seem to uh, apply ignorance to God. And I'll just give one example, Genesis chapter 3, God, after Adam and Eve have sinned against God and eaten of the, um, the, the fruit the, of the, the tree that they were forbidden from eating, God comes into the garden and they hide from him. And God says, where are you? And if this means that God really doesn't know where they are, then we haven't just lost God, uh, God's omniscience, his all-knowing nature, but we've also lost God's all-present nature. But this question isn't asked because of God's ignorance, and the context just, I think, just makes this abundantly clear, because it's the first of four questions that God asks, which he certainly knows the answer to. And the question itself isn't a result of uh, God's ignorance, but it brings out, uh, brings to light the foolishness of Adam and Eve that they think they can hide from God in the first place. And they are questions that are not asked for God's sake, as if he doesn't know the answer, but for Adam and Eve's sake. The questions are leading them to come out of hiding and, and come clean before God, because if they want to be reconciled to him by his mercy, then that's what they have to do. They have to confess their sin to him. God here 
is leading them to self-examination and confession by his gracious and patient questioning of them. The picture is sort of like an attorney in a courtroom whose questions aren't because he doesn't know the answer, but they are skillfully designed to bring out the answer from the person who's being questioned. That's one area of objection um, uh, to God's, God is all knowing. The second area is related to God's knowledge of the future. And we talked previously about not God's knowledge of past, present, and future events when we considered God as eternal. And if you recall, because God is eternal, God is outside of time, not constrained by time, above time, all time and all events within time are laid out before him. He can see them all from his eternal vantage point. And so he isn't constrained by time or subject to the frustration that comes with needing to, un needing to time to unfold in order to gain perfect knowledge, including knowledge of the future, as we are constrained and limited by that. The future doesn't lie hidden to him, such that he has to wait for it to unfold for him to know it, but it is just as known to him as if it were already past. And this is one of the main points in Isaiah, in chapters 41, 44, 46. I won't read all of those, but maybe you remember from our sermons in Isaiah, these chapters specifically talk about God's knowledge of the future, God's knowledge of future events and his ability to foretell and to infallibly foretell future events. And it talks about that as one of those things which proves him to be the true God. In other words, it's setting forth his ability to know the future infallibly and speak of the future infallibly as one of the things that proves him to be the true God as opposed to false gods who are ignorant of the future, who can't speak about the future events as he can. And so the Bible specifically and especially considers God's knowledge of the future as important, as one test of the true God versus false gods. God knows future events because God decreed future events. And to, to, so to clarify, when the Bible talks about God's knowledge of the future, it doesn't present God's knowledge of the future as mere foresight based on observation, as in he doesn't peer into the future like a magician would peer into a crystal ball to learn or guess what will happen or might happen in the future. First, this would be inconsistent with his other attributes because his knowledge then would change and grow based on what he foresees to happen. And so God would no longer be unchanging. And his knowledge then would be based on his creation. And so he would no longer be independent, but rather dependent upon the creation for his knowledge. The Bible doesn't describe God's foreknowledge as mere foresight, but as based on his eternal plan. Ephesians 1.11 tells us that in him... We were also chosen, not because God peered into the future and saw any response or decision that we would make, but in him we were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Here we see that God's foreknowledge is based on his eternal plan. He doesn't know it because it happens, but it happens because he knows it. It happens because he plans it. Augustine put it this way, that God does not know all creatures because they exist. They exist because he knows them. And so here comes the challenge and the objection then, that if God knows it and planned it, and even, in fact, if God only foresees it, either way, then it is, in fact, certain to happen. And so when it comes time for that thing to happen, I no longer have absolute freedom in that choice, but I am constrained to do what God has either foreknown and foreordained or what God has foreseen. And so people then say, conclude that either God knows and plans the future and we are then deprived of any degree of free will, 
or that we have free will and so God can't know or plan the future. But the Bible doesn't divide those things. It doesn't separate what God joins and holds together. And this conversation can involve a lot of technical language a discussion about what constitutes free will. I'm going to avoid most of that and just say this, that the Bible upholds and affirms together both genuine human freedom, if not absolute human freedom, and divine sovereignty. It upholds and joins together genuine human freedom and divine sovereignty. And that's what it means to be what the Bible presents us to be, created persons. Created persons. Being created, on the one hand, means that we are completely dependent upon God. In him we live and move and have our being, a passage we looked at a few weeks ago. We are totally, utterly dependent upon God for every breath, for every movement, for every aspect of our lives at all times. One person puts it this way, that we can't lift a finger apart from God's will. We are creatures, but we are also persons. Being persons means that we are responsible agents. We think, we desire, we decide, we choose, we act willfully out of the desires of our hearts, and we are responsible for those choices and actions that we make. We are not robots without minds or puppets without wills, but we are persons. The Bible presents us as created persons and holds those things paradoxical as they may seem, holds them together and never apologizes for it. And so one of the great paradoxes and mysteries of the Bible is how we put it together that we are in fact created persons where God ordains and is sovereign over and plans all things, knows all future events as though they were past, and yet we at the same time choose and decide and act with responsibility and accountability to him. I started off this sermon series saying that if we were to believe in a God that's worthy of our worship, then there will necessarily be things about him that we can't quite grasp with our finite and limited and sinful human minds. There will be things about him that are left in mystery, that seem paradoxical, that seem like they can't fit together, but they only can't fit together to us. But they fit together to God in his mind, in his knowledge, and in his wisdom. And that we shouldn't be concerned by that when there are things left in mystery that we can't fully grasp or comprehend, but we should be comforted by that because that is evidence that the God portrayed in the Bible is real. And that he is above us and over us and greater than us and different than us and not the same as us. Because his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts because he is God. God is all-knowing. Second, God is all-wise. In Romans 16, 27, Paul calls God the only wise God to whom glory is forever due. Knowledge and wisdom, of course, are related things, but they are not the same things. And for us, they don't always go together. You can have a lot of knowledge, but be totally clueless as to what to do with that knowledge, how to put it into practice, and so you can lack wisdom. And you can have wisdom without knowing everything, but you can't have wisdom without knowing some things. Because wisdom is built on knowledge. Wisdom is the applying of knowledge, the living out of knowledge. And if your knowledge is faulty and lacking, then your wisdom may well too be faulty and lacking. For us, wisdom and knowledge do not always go together. But for God, they always do. With God, we can always be assured that he has perfect knowledge and perfect wisdom. Because he is all-knowing and all-wise. He doesn't just have a lot of information or know a lot of facts for trivia night, but he knows how to put that knowledge to use for his good and wise plan. Knowledge and wisdom always go together perfectly for God, but also power and wisdom always go together perfectly for God. Again, 
For us, that isn't always the case. And power without wisdom, power without knowing how to use power in a right and good and helpful way can be a dangerous thing. But God's power always works according to his wisdom. His power never corrupts him. His power never blinds him like it so often does for us when we have power. But his power is always guided by his wisdom and his righteousness and his goodness and his love. God's wisdom is his ability to apply his knowledge in action in a good and right way for a good and right end. And that end is his glory and the ultimate good of his people. And this side of glory, we don't always see how that fits together. But in heaven, we will look back and give him praise and glory for his wisdom. Sometimes, oftentimes, it seems otherwise to us. But that is to be expected. If his wisdom always seemed wise to us, then either we would have divine wisdom, which we don't, or we would, he would have corrupt and limited wisdom. It would be susceptible to the same limits, the same lack of perspective and knowledge that we are plagued with. And so it's only to be expected that sometimes God's wisdom doesn't seem wise to us, but his wisdom is so wise that the highest wisdom of this world is described as foolishness in comparison to it. 1 Corinthians 1.25 For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than than human strength. The foolishness of God is, this isn't saying that God is foolish, of course, but that his wisdom is so wise that even the, the, if there was a lowest part of it, even that would be higher than the highest part of human worldly wisdom. Of course, there is no lacking or low part of God's wisdom, but so great, so vast the difference between God's wisdom and ours. That the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. In this passage, Paul specifically refers to the cross of Jesus. That according to the world's wisdom, looks like foolishness. Looks like weakness, looks like defeat, looks like shame. But according to God's wisdom, it is the best news that there ever was. Where we see the wisdom of God's plan and his power and victory over sin and death accomplished. Let me suggest two applications that we gain from considering God's all-knowing nature and God's all-wise nature, that we should have humility in ourselves and that we can have total trust in God. We should have humility in ourselves, particularly in the judgments we make about others. And uh, this, I was helped in the, in considering this application in one of the books I'm reading, a book on the attributes of God, where the writer describes the way that we often make judgments about other people reflects a lack of humility and almost an assumption that we have God's wisdom that only God has. Humility in ourselves, particularly in the judgments we make about others, is how we can apply this attribute of God. And maybe this is a particularly timely application. Only God knows all things, and so only God can make infallible judgments about all things. But we often act as though we are God. We make judgments about others that we believe are infallible, even if or when we lack the knowledge we need to make an accurate judgment or a fair judgment. We often judge things about other people that we really cannot see. We often harshly or unfairly judge other people's motives. And Christians sometimes need to make judgments about others, but we should always do so with careful humility, making sure we are making a true judgment, making sure that we are making a fair judgment, and making sure that we are doing so in love, motivated by love and filled with grace, and often, we should remember that we're better off leaving some judgments to God, who alone judges justly. So we should have humility in ourselves, and we can have total trust in God. The second application, we can entrust our lives to our all-knowing, all-wise God. 
He knows all things. He is all wise. But it doesn't always appear that way to us. And so, again, we need humility. We can trust that God's commands, that he gives us our good, even in the times when they don't appear or feel that way to us because we know that God knows us perfectly because he knows all things. And we know that God knows this world we live in perfectly because he knows all things. And so he knows how you and me best live in this world. And so he knows how to command and direct us in the way that is right towards our good. We can trust that his commands are good and we can trust that his ways are good. Even when we wonder what God could possibly be doing in our lives, even in the darkest and most trying and perplexing circumstances of life, even when we are angry at God for what is happening in, in our, our lives because he is doing something that we can't see any wisdom in in the moment. We should remember that if we are getting angry at God for our situation, it's because we are describing to him some power, some degree of power over our situation. And as Tim Keller helpfully puts it in his book, The Reason for God, that if God is powerful enough to be angry at for the suffering we're experiencing, then can't he also at the same time be wise enough to have some good reason for allowing it? And most people, when they look back on suffering, or difficult or dark times in their life, can see how even though they would never ask for it, even though they would never, certainly never delight in the suffering itself, even though they would never wish it upon anyone else, nevertheless can look back and see some way that they grew through it. They can see how it made them the person they are. And they wouldn't want to be without the transformation that came about as a result of it. And that's why one person put it that God's providence is best read backwards. Because often it's only on the other side of it that we can look back and see God's wisdom that we couldn't see in the midst of it. And so we can entrust ourselves to him that he is with us and leading us and guiding us for our good according to his perfect wisdom. Francis Schaeffer wrote that with a very big God, there are no little people. Sometimes we think the opposite, that with a big God, maybe we would lie uh, far outside the realm of his concern. But actually, if he were a little God, then we would fall, then we could fall outside the limited scope of his little concern because he would have he wouldn't have the extensive knowledge to know us or the perfect wisdom and power to care for us. But it's because he is such a big God, an all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful, all-wise God. It's because he's such a big God that he can know us so fully and care for us so wonderfully. Let's entrust ourselves to his fatherly care. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you know all things. You know all things about us. And that, on the one hand, leads us to confession. For certainly, we are sinners in your sight. But God, it also comforts our hearts. That you know the hairs on our head. You know all things about us, and so you can and do care for us as our Heavenly Father. Help us to trust your wisdom even when we can't see it. Trusting that you are good and loving, that you know all things and that your wisdom is wonderful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.